welcome to the course environmental impact assessment and in today's lecture we are going to continue with our um, coverage on socio-economic impact assessment and we are going to today especially look at the social aspects of impact. We had previously looked into the economic impacts and then the kind of calculations we undertake within that. So today we are going to look at various aspects of social impacts and related with the project and related with the EIA. So um, our key reference for this is chapter 14 which deals with socioeconomic impact number 2 part 2. So you can, um, this course book which we are referring to by um, Theraval and uh, Wood. So uh, we are uh, well aware that uh, there are many, many kind of social impacts which uh, occur because of the major developments and they also occur because of uh, various direct and indirect economic impact which takes place. So uh, we also see that uh, whenever the workforce is involved, uh, involved uh, in the construction of a project and its operation, they also exert impact or uh, like there will be increase in the population because there will be a lot of people who will be coming into the site in and around to the site of different age, gender, language, culture and they would also exert pressure in the host community. And then uh, you would also see that there is increase in demand of uh, like there will be increase in demand for housing and then also increase in demand for local services. For example, there will be increase in demand for education requirements for all the migrants who will be coming to the site like there will be uh, requirement for more schools or more space in the school and then more uh, health facility, recreational facility. So it is going to exert pressure on the existing infrastructure. Likewise, you will see that there might be uh, changes in the local crime rates and there might be other issues also coming up and then it might also link with a lot of community stress how the host community or the other communities are able to cope up with the change. So it might also lead to stress and uh, there might be other kind of impact as well related with health so which we have already seen health impact assessments and you might also see uh, uh, impacts related with displacement and resettlement which we are going to see in the next uh, lecture as well. So uh, accordingly given this context our, uh, the second part of the lecture will include we will look into what all we cover in terms of scoping and baseline studies when we deal with social impact assessments and then how, what are the different key issues, agendas which you might have to look into while doing undertaking the scoping um, and then what all approach you need to adopt in order to look at the impact on the population, to look at the impact on the local services and then other kind of impact like social cohesion, co uh, also like stress and all that, uh, what kind of considerations, what might be different types which you might encounter. Then uh, in this coverage you would also look at uh, the impact prediction and evaluation. So what are the different methods which are available to look at the population changes, how do you look at whether the changes are significant or not and how do you also look into the accommodation requirements and their significance and then how do you look at the demand for local services, its significance and other social impact about the cohesion, displacement and resettlement. Then we'll uh, cover the mitigation and enhancement aspect where we'll look at uh, what kind of measures are usually taken. We'll also familiarize ourselves with the concept of community benefit agreements, CBAs, and then we'll also look into social impact management plans, what are they, um, what all they are, or through those, what all you're required to prepare and present. So that will be our coverage and uh, out of that the expected learning outcome is that 
uh, you should be able to identify the key purpose of scoping while you're dealing with socioeconomic um, impact assessments and then identify key elements which you might have to deal with and then different approaches you might adopt. Likewise, you, uh, you should be able to identify different elements of impact prediction and different tools and methods of evaluation. And then uh, you should be able to uh, review the different mitigation and enhancement measures which are available to you and then also discuss and define community benefits agreements and uh, social impact management plans. So uh, moving on, we'll look into scoping and baseline studies. So uh, looking at uh, the key purpose, what you are really required to undertake when you are dealing with scoping and baseline study is that it is important that you understand the characteristic of the host society. So wherever the project is going to come, it is very important that you understand how the host society is because the impact, uh, the significance of impact would vary a lot depending on the host society. So it is important that you identify how is the society, so you need to create the profile of the society uh, which is going to be likely to be affected because of the kind of development which will take place. And it is needed that you draw conclusion or you build profile based on the data what you get as well as on the attitude. So not only just on the data but also the attitude aspects like uh, how is their attitude about receiving certain things or how would they deal with it, what is their past history, what kind, what would be their reactions or acceptance level. So you need to look at that, those aspects and and when you look at these, this allows very meaningful understanding of the host community. So keep that in mind that when you are undertaking scoping, especially for the social issues, you need to uh, understand the host community uh, and you need to build their profile as well as you need to, while you are building the profile, you need to look at both the aspect, the data aspect as well as the attitude aspect of the host community. And uh, further in this stage, you also need to identify various stakeholders. So who are the different people who will be affected by your project? So those, for example, can include people living in the surrounding of, uh, li uh, of your project area. So that's the simplest way to identify people who are living in the surrounding. Then uh, it might also include the construction workers who, who would migrate into the area of development, so who would be coming, in, coming to your site because of the construction work which will take place. And then uh, it would also include people living near where the migrant construction workers may reside. So not only the construction migrants, but the people also living in and around where the migrants would be settling in temporary or permanently. Plus, uh, you also need to look at whole range of agencies and developers and supply chain links. So uh, what kind of economic activity would take place, what kind of activities would take place, and who all will be involved, who will be at the disadvantage, who will be at the advantage, and then what kind of activities might go on in that place. So uh, as a, a professional where you're preparing the social impact assessments, you need to identify all these range of stakeholders. Further, you also need to identify the socio-political context of the host community. So it's just not the data or the attitude but and the, the economy part of it. But you would also be required to look into the political context, like looking into the past history and looking into uh, like how people might react to it and what would be the acceptance level or what kind of disadvantage the people had been in that particular locality. So uh, depending on how they are likely to respond to your proposal um, uh, and what kind of trust they have in the government because given the political con context there might be situation where people have distrust on the government 
and also developers. So that can cause a lot of delay, that can also cause a lot of uh, 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 stress on the people. So th those all past experiences have to be taken care of. So in, in this figure, you can see this is from one of the uh, case, you can see how they are providing um, the social baseline information for the particular area and uh, they are aligning it with the national standards and uh, you can see how the performance ranging from very pure, poor to very good. You can see how the profile of the people have been created. You can see that how the uh, housing and health is there and then as per the national standards you can see it's, it's going little on the higher side, housing and the environmental health which is almost touching three, likewise you can see identity, image and heritage which is like uh, considerably low 1.5, similarly you can see social mixing and inclusion and cohesion which is going above two, well-being which is nearly touching 2.5 and education and skills you can see it's just two, employment is again uh, under two and then empowerment, participation and access is again 1.5 and health and safety is 2.5. So you see in that scale how, how we are trying to understand the context of the people and then their environment who are living in the, the project site, the influence site of the project. Uh, we can see from their example, like how these profile buildings are done. This is not exactly from the AI airport, but I have taken it uh, how the social profiles are built. So I have taken the example from Mumbai Metropolitan Regional Plan 2016 2036. So you can uh, see from here, like how the profiles are built and how different graphs and numbers data are used to understand the characteristics of the community, host community. So you can see here, so the graph showing uh, cities declining share of the population, how the population is declining. You can see population within different uh, areas, how these areas are and then how these uh, tables and these graphs are used to communicate and also understand it. At the same time, you can see they have used GIS maps to indicate the population distribution. You can also see population density distribution here. So you can see like how with the legend, if you read how the population is from 500 being the lighter color to dark green being above 1 crore, so you can see how the population distribution is and then how the density is, likewise you can see the light color showing density up to 250 to about uh, 30 to 1000, so you can see those density here and all these data is taken from census 2011 which you can see here. See uh, and further you can see the demographic characteristic here again. So you can look at the table on the left hand side and all the uh, how the data has been presented so that you understand the profiles. So you can see eight sex pyramids of Greater Mumbai, how it is. So they are showing it for different time periods. So you can see 1991, 2001, 2011 for Thane district and Raigar district. So you yourself can see that how male population is expanding, the blue side is going on increasing rapidly compared to the red side which indicates the female. So that, that helps you to understand what's really happening because of all the activities which are going on taking in that place. So likewise, uh, the, I'm showing you so that you understand how the different uh, socioeconomic data, uh, the community profiles are indicated here. So here understanding the economic profile, you can see here on the left hand side figure taken from the report, you can see the tertiary sector, uh, pink uh, you can see secondary sector and then in blue you can see the primary sector. So you see the composition, this, these kind of graphs help you to understand by the proportion itself you can see that there are lots and lots of people who are involved in the tertiary sector. And uh, since it's uh, showing in t uh, timeline, 93, 94, 98, 99, 99, 2000, 
and so on till 2013. So you can also see that the secondary sector is declining and tertiary sector is increasing. So you, you can also understand what's really going on within the host community. And then in the right hand side you can see registered and unregistered manufacturing in the district. So all these profiles are presented. You can see the employment growth sector wise. You can see the mining, querying, fishing, agriculture, hunting and forestry. So what's really how you can look at the fluctuation in 1998 agriculture and housing was very big, the blue color. And now you see in 2005 that has shrinked a lot. And then you see mining and querying which was like Considerable in 2005 has also uh, geographically reduced in certain areas. So you, you can see all those how in Mumbai, Thane, Raigarh and Mumbai metropolitan region what kind of how things are changing from 1998 to 2005. So th these kind of uh, data and data how you present the data helps you to build a profile. So here again with this example, you can see the ranking of subsectors based on the employment generated in various urban local bodies. So you can see totally total uh, like in the left hand side you can see primary, secondary, ter ter tertiary sectors and how geographically they are distributed. And in the table in the right hand side you can see the uh, primary sectors and all kind of uh, ULBs within which this uh, uh, grid and which is the prime area for uh, like number one, two and so on. It's indicating which is the primary sector in that particular area which is providing employment. So you're cautious about uh, what you're dealing with and you're well aware about it. And then uh, likewise you can see household by dwelling unit size here, how that it has been indicated by pi diagram. Likewise you can also see again housing affordability, they have analyzed and then you can also see uh, population projection for uh, Thane area on the right hand side for 2021 Thane, you can see it for 2031 and 2041. So how the population will increase and then they have done in three methods and they have seen then the red line indicates the linear methods. You have green line which is done by the log method and then you have a poly method here. So all the three methods have been used to indicate the projection. So uh, population uh, is an important part uh, in the social uh, assessments and uh, you, you need to see how geographical, what kind of geographical extent you have to take, undertake uh, to uh, understand the social impact. So uh, during the scoping stage you would also see the geographical extent of how much population has to be taken and to what extent the population has to be taken and uh, you would be identifying the impact area and uh, you will look at uh, the residential locations of in-migrant workers and their families. And uh, this would also have impact on the accommodation, things like that. And uh, usually the approach which is taken while you're dealing with uh, population is, and especially when you're trying to find out the boundary, you usually take the fixed distance or a radius like you also saw in those maps, how the radius have been taken. So uh, you can take a certain radius from the project site and sometimes you can also take administrative or the political areas which is easy to maintain and easy to get data on those political lines, uh, administrative lines uh, from the local authority, health authority or so school and other areas so all that data can be collected and you can take it uh, as per the fixed distance or as per the administrative boundary. So uh, uh, that, that, that can be uh, one way and then the other way could be the footprints and uh, like how much the project is really influencing based on that footprint you can also identify the area.
Further, apart from the population and the geographical extent, you also need to look at what kind of impact it might have on the population itself, the demographic impact. So, uh, so it, uh, all these kind of changes will uh, depend upon what uh, kind of changes your project is likely to bring on the uh, population and the characteristic of the population existing, like what is the size of the existing population, what's the structure, uh, and what kind of changes your project is going to bring into that particular uh, area among the people. So it's very important to uh, like really establish the uh, existing population baseline in the impact area in terms of size, gender, age, and profile. So you already saw the example, like from the reports, how those profiles are built, how those tables are built. Uh, there can be many sources of information. You saw that it was built from the census. So uh, from all those data sources, it can be built, and there can be very interesting and communicating, uh, interesting ways of easy way of communicating those profile to the decision makers. So looking at uh, different sources of data, so one of the major source of uh, population data in many countries is national census or similar, anything similar to that. And you would also find other source of data that include uh, population estimates where the local or regional governments have been doing estimates. So you can also take, uh, like you might not really need to make your own estimates, you can uh, adopt from any secondary study which has been done. And you can also use proxy data. Now you can also use various market analysis or studies which are available in that particular your study area. And whenever you are, whichever country you are dealing with, whichever context you are dealing with, if you do not have access to data, then you might have to undertake survey. So if, uh, like I, I showed you the population projection from um, Mumbai Metropolitan Regional Plan. So you, you also need to undertake population projection and forecast what will really happen in uh, years, decades to come. So uh, you usually those are done by national and local authorities input. And then you could also see the land use uh, planning work. and. Uh, other uh, estimates which are done for different levels of schools and infrastructure, so you can look at that. And uh, generally, uh, usually for the small area, projections are not usually undertaken and it's not said to be reliable as well. So uh, you can also look at uh, the URDPFI guidelines, which also provide certain population projection methods. So uh, all these methods are available for population projection. So uh, further, like we said, that social impact also includes impact on the housing stock. So uh, you, uh, all the population uh, data will have implication of how much housing is available and uh, uh, in that area and how much pressure more it will create. And you also need to understand what kind of tenure is there. Uh, are the owner occupied? Are they privately rented, rented with a job or business or rented from government body? So all that understanding has to be developed for a bigger project where there, there can be larger implications, larger impacts of the project. And when you are looking at these housing requirements, you are re uh, required to look at all the requirements at various stages. So not only just one cumulative requirement, but you would be required to look at how much housing would be required at, or how much pressure would be created at the construction stage and uh, uh, what kind of pressure would be created uh, during the operational stage and what will really happen when the project is decommissioned. So here in this, you can again uh, revisit how uh, this Mum Mumbai Metropolitan Regional Development Authority is indicating the housing stock in various urban local bodies. So if you're doing EIA in nearby area, you can also use these sources for your reference and uh, you can adopt these methods as well. 
And then uh, similarly, you have to look at the local services. So all these in-migrants, people coming from different economic background for different purpose, from the construction to operation, uh, they would have certain requirement for local services. And they would come with families or come individually, but then they would have requirements for education, health, recreational, uh, the uh, safety issue, fire and social kind of social services, all that would be required. So you can, uh, you might have to look into that as well. And then uh, there might be concerns about social uh, cohesion also. So uh, uh, if we understand the term social cohesion, it refers to the sense of belongingness to the community and their satisfaction with life in the community and whether or not the community is considered a social asset or not. So there have been also studies where uh, and uh, the development projects and uh, rapid urbanization and a lot of construction and real estate project and a lot of in-migrant people coming, people have started losing sense of belongingness and have people started feeling a lot of st stress uh, uh, in many of the areas. So uh, you, you also need to understand, but it also depends on country to country, context to context, how much importance, significance they give to the social cohesion. So uh, in a cohesive community, if we try to understand cohesive community, a network of positive relationship is generated and maintained so they trust each other, or they are positive and happy about it, and they have a sense of belongingness and have a sense of pride in the community. So uh, it's important that you profile the social cohesion, but uh, it is also said that at the same time it's very challenging and often data is limited and often you have to rely on a lot of surveys which can again be challenged for its authenticity. So it's may, in, uh, and a such kind of study may in include well-being and deprivation and a sense of personal safety and fear of crime and so on. So uh, you, you see for estimating such a kind of things, uh, uh, social cohesion or OECD guide also provides a guidelines for measuring subjective well-being and uh, national studies such as UK Index of National Wellbeing. So you can also look at these studies and you can see how these social cohesion can be measured and can be adopted in, for your case. So when we look at the study, UK based study, it looks into four key questions like how satisfied are you with your life nowadays? To what extent do you feel the things you do in your life are worth while and how happy did you feel yesterday and how anxious did you feel yesterday. So you see how it's very subjective and very qualitative in uh, terms and then the record what they make is from 0 to 10 where 0 is not at all and 10 is the completely happy, satisfied, so that kind of things. So I have I've given you a link to these uh, guidelines. You can see here the OECD uh, measuring subjective well-being you can see here as well as you have a link to index of national well-being by UK and then uh, you can also look at deprivation indexes uh, where you have uh, it helps you to social profiling of good uh, you can see uh, another good example from England, an index of multiple deprivation IMDs so we had spoken about it before as well and uh, you can see the example here of composite index of multiple deprivation IMD at uh, lower layers super output area, LSOA of Brad Fold in UK. So you can see the composite index of multiple deprivation here. So you can see the legend, when we lead the legend, we see the number one is the most deprived and number 10 is the least deprived and the most deprived are the darker color and the least deprived is the lighter shades you can see here. And see the how the deprived areas are in this particular map, you can see that. So you also have international level example of deprivation index. Uh, which is provided by Global Multidisciplinary Poverty Index, MPI. So the Global MPI has three dimensions and ten indicators. 
So you can see the 10 indicators here in the diagram of the Global Multi-Poverty Index. And so that uh, you can see the year of schooling, school of attendance, child mortality, nutrition, electricity, sanitation, water, floor, cooking, fuel, assets, and so on, like a health, education, health, and standard of living. So within these, you can see. For, further, you see in this particular that uh, every dimension is equally weighted, and uh, it provides an example of how uh, you can apply it in India. So you can see that uh, OPHI here, uh, another example from Indian context, you can see the percentage of Indian population who are, where we are looking at the multidimensional poverty index, MPI. So here you see different aspects of sanitation, drinking water, floor, cooking, fuel, assets, year of schooling, school attendance, child mortality, nutrition, and electricity. So all, all that you can see here, so uh, you can look at this uh, source, OPHI, for this. So you, you can also look at uh, crime and freedom, uh, how, how people feel, uh, and then uh, that's a major concern in many countries. And uh, though it has been very, very uh, less covered in case of impact assessment, but it's there. And uh, there is a major concern, but it's mostly not covered. Uh, you can see examples like when you have young male uh, migrants coming, uh, then um, it creates a lot of uh, issue about crime and behavioral issues in the host locality. And uh, you, you can have a lot of sources for these kind of data. Uh, you can look at uh, crime data fear of crime data. Uh, all these you can get from the police authority uh, and this can act as a valuable source. So that, that was about the scoping. Now looking at the impact prediction and evaluation. So uh, how, how do we really uh, look at uh, what kind of population change is happening and whether it's significant or not. So. Um, you saw that population change can happen. So population change uh, are caused by because of the major projects which come up and it can have both direct and indirect uh, change in the population. And uh, the direct increase is the in, pro in migration which is happening because of the project, the people who are directly getting hired in the, all the uh, stages of the project. and. Um, and uh, the family members which come on, along with them. And uh, 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 therefore, you have uh, the easy way to calculate is uh, to uh, come up with, uh, or the estimation for this is the total number of employees moving into the impact area, the proportion of these in migrants' employees, bringing other family members and then the characteristic of these fam families. So that can be direct population change can be calculated from the project design itself. And then there can be indirect way of calculating also. So uh, first looking at the significance of population change. So uh, uh, how do you really look whether this kind of population change is significant or not? So. Uh, the uh, significance of project uh, related population change will like what are the factors which really guide that. So looking at these three main factors, so the existing population size and structure in the impact area. So w what's the existing population size, whether it's small or it's big enough to absorb those population. So it will depend on that. And then it will also depend on the geographical distribution of in-migrant population. So how are they distributed geographically in that particular location? And then it will also depend on the timing of the population change. So how, when does that happen and how much vulnerable or what susceptible or how susceptible this population is about the changes. So, uh, and it would vary a lot with the age, gender, social characteristics, and how it is. So, uh, that all one needs to look at. So, the very first step 
in assessing the significance is to express the estimated project related population increase as a percentage of baseline population in the impact areas. So how much, as per the current population, how much change do you really expect in terms of percentage? That's the diff, uh, very simplest way of explaining the significance of the population change. And then you also need to provide the predicted age structure of in-migrant uh, also would be compared with the baseline age structure. So how, 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 how big is that percentage? It will all depend. And uh, uh, other step would be to look at the geographical distribution of the immigrants and how uh, population change would impact the local people, how it is going to influence, how, how it is going to displace certain people. And then um, there's another very simple way of doing it. There's a gravity model, which, uh, which is an approach which uh, uh, estimates the number of employees moving into the particular settlement would be positive function of that settlement size and a negative function of its distance from the project site. So you also adopt this gravity model. So looking at the gravity model, it's the mathematical formula based on the regression analysis and probability theory that, uh, uh, that takes into consideration relevant push, what will happen, pull or economic factors into consideration when suggesting like how the distribution would ha happen. So uh, you, you can see the formula here, gravitational model. For example, a gravity model, uh, uh, the goal of the gravity model is to let the readers know about uh, uh, like uh, what will be the uh, number of influencing forces. So what will be the distance, cost of living, affecting migrations or movement or large number of entities of same type and uh, like uh, people, uh, w what will happen to them and uh, or what kind of uh, uh, between people also, between group of people, how things will move. So it is going to look at the influencing forces, it's going to look at the number of uh, entities which it's going to affect and then it is going to give you number and then it will also tell you what is the probable distribution of all these things going to happen. So that's about the gravity model. So uh, moving on, we can also look at the accommodation requirements and uh, how that has to be taken care of while uh, taking the social e impact assessment. So uh, that has, has to be seen in the impact prediction. So total amount of accommodation required uh, by the determined by the size of the in-migrant workforce and uh, how that has to be provided and what kind of impact it is going to have on the overall housing stock. So you can see here in the network diagram, you can see the local population and how what is the present housing deficit, future housing needs, and then how uh, there will be incoming population which will add additional housing needs and there will be an operation stage and then um, uh, there will be a permanent population and what kind of local vacancies will be created, impact on the permanent stock and then how you look at the significant impact. So that's how you can look at uh, different aspects, different stages and then how it can be uh, like how much changes are happening. So you need to look at the significance of accommodation requirements. So uh, while looking at the significance of this, you look at the net change due to the project. So how much change is happening and again you look into the percentage, you can tell from the baseline what's the kind of additional requirement will happen. So that, that's very basic way of calculating and then you see that what all will be the different providers and then there can be increase in the, uh, from the tourism sector as well and then how from where all, all those stocks will be provided. Then looking at the demand for the local services, so uh, as I have already explained in migrant employees and their families uh, will have pressure on the services which are pro uh, there. So here you can see under the network diagram which shows the uh, education impacts. So you, you see that incoming population, potential customer age group 
and then what will be their needs and what will be the future population, how they will have impact on nursery, school, higher, and then uh, what's the baseline here based on that, what is the current scenario, and then all that to add it together and then how significant the change would be. So you would be uh, uh, showing it in this way, uh, trying to understand what kind of different factors will play and whether that change is going to be, whether that pressure is going to be significant or not in terms of percentage. So you would be looking at the significance of demand and services. So uh, the important indicator of significance of local services is again the capacity threshold. So whether what's the capacity, how much it will be able to take more pressure uh, when the demand is increased, that all understanding has to be developed. And then there can be other social impact, what we talked about, cohesion and other things. So that also needs to be taken care of in this. And the other key aspect is the displacement and resettlement. So that we'll be looking in the next uh, lecture. So uh, there are, which we have partially covered when we dealt with the concept, so there will be the physical displacement, economic displacement conceptually which we have covered before, but just to look at where you physically uh, re rehabilitate people and economic displacement when their sources of employment are impacted by the kind of project which you're doing. So that was about uh, the impact significance. Now we're looking at the mitigation and enhancements, how you can undertake that. So the, um, uh, when you're looking at the mitigation and enhancements, uh, you adopt a number of approaches, how you can mitigate uh, the impact uh, on the population. So the most basic would be encourage maximum recruitment of the labor. So you employ, absorb them as much as possible uh, within the daily commuting distance of the project site and so on. But in many cases it has been seen that it's not really feasible to employ a lot of local people because of the training and capacity. So uh, uh, also training and capacity uh, and other infrastructure has to be provided there. and. Uh, and then also certain uh, quality of life can all be also be improved by improving the local services level. And then uh, looking at the community benefit, uh, there can be also provision for community benefit funding by the developer and uh, they can also t take care of it and then some of the countries do that. You can uh, see the example from the Scotland renewable energy scheme, so where they have the so looking at uh, the community benefit agreements, so if we see that community benefits agreements, CBAs, are also becoming very popular uh, in terms of uh, the elements what are uh, covered in the assessment process and the development process uh, in the major projects and especially it has been done a lot in the energy projects. So uh, this uh, kind of agreement, CBA, it uh, provides a range of benefits. Uh, uh, offered uh, to compensate for specific project uh, local impact. So it recognizes the, com uh, it involves community uh, in perceiving what's the national interest and then it also uh, uh, covers the objectives and then uh, it also uh, intakes in these special local needs and then uh, it uh, creates a plan accordingly. So the type of benefits uh, which are given are financial incentives like annual payments, lump sum or both and then also social benefits in kind like additional transport improvement, affordable housing, uh, village uh, like community centers and other sports facilities, um, improved telecom and training facilities and all these kind of benefits are given to the community. So you can also see IAIA also provides six ways of which company uh, the projects can contribute in local benefits to the host community. Like you can have uh, social investment funding, they can create, they can also create local content, uh, especially employment. And then you can also have shared infrastructure, then you can have capacity building, training support, supporting community initiatives, uh, funding for those uh, community initiatives and payments of uh, like other uh, 
royalties to the local landowners or local authorities, so making them as a, also shareholders in the project. So social investment may also go in the specially managed social investment fund also for uh, community infrastructures. You can be looking at the schools, hospitals, and then also might have microfinance schemes and so on. So that was about the CBA. Now looking at the social impact management plans. So this is provided by IA. IA. So it uh, highlights that it's very important to have social impact management plans. And it is uh, the need for social impact management plan is growing and uh, large bodies, governments have been recognizing it. So you see examples from Queensland, uh, which created a environmental impact statement process and uh, a social impact uh, management plan is integral part of EIA uh, process itself in that particular country. So you can find the guidelines for preparing the, uh, this uh, social impact management plan. So this uh, guideline is provided to you and then uh, uh, you can also look at this guideline. Further uh, moving on to the monitoring, so we can see the monitoring examples like how we can really monitor the social impact assessment. Monitoring is very important because we project a lot of things like what kind of uh, impact, positive impact is going to happen, so whether it's happening or not. So looking at that, you can see that uh, how they have in this table, you can look at what kind of procedure they have adopted. Uh, the uh, uh, how, uh, when the monitoring has to be taken care of and what kind of issues have to be checked for. So uh, like we are saying, the employment will be generated and they will, local people will be involved. So induction pr procedure, code of conduct of sign off, so you need to check that and uh, you need to check it when the employment requirements are ca coming, captive or uh, like you need to look at the worker's name, gender, ethnicity, and their addresses, and then you can check whether those employment, local employment, have been created for the local people or not. So those kind of things can be taken care of. And then specific post-induction workforce surveys can be done, and um, there can be regular reporting by different agencies also. So uh, like this, you can also monitor what kind of commitment in terms of call, uh, level of services, in terms of employment, in terms of housing, how they are proposing and how those things are really monitored. So that was about the social impact assessment. So summarizing what we covered today. So we looked at the scoping and baseline study stage. We looked at uh, what all you need to take care of and what are the possible impacts which happens and how, how do you collect data for that. Then we looked at impact prediction and evaluation. How do you really evaluate the significance of any kind of change which you see? And then we looked at mitigation and enhancement methods. And then also looked in that we looked at the community benefit uh, agreements and social impact management plans. And then also looked at the uh, example of uh, monitoring. So that was all what we covered today. And these were the references for this particular session. And you can also see certain suggested watch and read in this. So winding up, please feel free to ask questions related uh, with the subject. Let us know about any concerns you have. Do share your opinions, experiences, and suggestions. Looking forward to interacting and co-learning with you while exploring EIA. Thank you.